Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hanunaga High School. This is our, I'm Brian Brown, and this is our final section of notes over Chapter 17. And what we're really doing is looking at um, how we can use some of the principles that we've talked about in this chapter to try and determine if a sample contains certain ions. And this is something that we're going to be doing at the end of the year after the AP test. So this is a video that you're probably going to end up coming back and viewing again when we get to the long 8-10 day lab that we do after the AP test. Because this is really what we're fundamentally going to be doing. We're not only going to do it with cations, but we're also going to do the same thing with an anion component. So what we have here is a whole bunch of possible cations that can be dissolved in water in solution. And we would like a method of trying to determine which of these cations are actually in the solution. And we can use differences in solubilities in a variety of different situations, common ion effect, playing with pH, metal complex, to precipitate out and therefore determine the presence of certain of these substances. So what we've done, and this is something that scientists have taken a look at how we can break these things down in a coherent way, is we've divided these different types of metal cations into different groups. Now, group one would be the only metals in the entire list that would form insoluble chlorides. So everything else, if you put chloride with them, have a high enough solubility that would, they wouldn't precipitate out. So if you mix something like 6 molar HCl, so notice this is a flow chart that takes us through exactly what we're going to be doing. If we add 6 molar HCl, that's going to contribute chloride. And depending on what your KSP value is, if your KSP is low enough, if you have a very low solubility, that'll cause the precipitation of the metal chloride out of solution. And out of all the things in this list, the only ones that will precipitate when you add 6 molar HCl would be silver chloride, mercury chloride, and lead chloride. So those would all form precipitates. None of the rest of them would. So if we add 6 molar HCl, that tells us we have to have the presence of at least one of those metals in there from group one. So what we're going to look at is how we can use differences in solubilities of salts to separate those ions and identify them. So the group one is basically, when we're adding HCl as a strong acid that's giving H plus and Cl minus, only silver, mercury, and lead are low enough in solubility that they will form a precipitate with the chloride when we do that. All other cations are going to stay dissolved. So if we get a precipitate here, then we know we have one or more of those. And at that point, we'd have to do something more to find out if it's silver, mercury, or lead that's in there. Here we're just identifying, okay, we have to have at least one of our group one metals inside there. Now, after we've added the acid, we now have an acidic solution. And anything else inside there is still going to stay in solution. It's going to remain dissolved. So they're going to stay as cations, which is what our flow chart shows right here. So these would precipitate out, and we can separate them out with, precip uh, with filtration. The remainder would stay in solution, so they're going to stay dissolved. Now, after filtration, if we have any group 2s, now remember our solution is now acidic because we added a whole bunch of HCl in there. If we treat it with H2S, any metal with a low solubility with sulfide is going to precipitate out. And it turns out that group 2s are all of the things that, under these acidic conditions, have a low enough solubility of uh, sulfides, metal sulfides, to cause a precipitate at this point. So if we get a precipitate here, we know we have one or more of the substances from group 2. Now, why is the acidic so important in this particular case? Now remember, S2- minus is a basic anion. It will react with H plus to form OH minus. So this will react with the acid, shifting solubility of the equilibrium to the right. And that will increase the sulfide solubility. Only the things with very, very, very low solubilities at this point will precipitate out and not stay dissolved. So adding our acid is basically shifting the solubility so that only things with very, very low sulfide solubility will stay dissolved. Other substances, if we didn't have the acidic environment, would precipitate out. But at this acidity, we've pushed equilibrium far enough to the right that most of the things, unless they have a very low solubility, are going to stay dissolved. Next, after filtration once again, the solution is made basic by adding ammonium sulfide. Now, why basic? Remember, in a basic solution, the sulfide ion increases in concentration. Remember, acidic lower the S2 minus, so basic will raise it. So now we're going to look at the other things, things that form insoluble compounds but weren't low enough under those acidic conditions to actually precipitate out, but under basic conditions will precipitate out. And those are all of the group 3 situations that we're looking at here.
Now, adding the ammonium sulfide would cause the S2- concentration to increase significance, significantly. If the increase in concentration causes the ion product to exceed KSP, then once again a precipitation occurs. Now, finally, in a basic solution, the OH- increases, and the substances with low hy hydroxide solubilities will precipitate. So what we end up with here is a bunch of insoluble sulfides and insoluble hydroxides under these conditions. So that would be a way to pull out aluminum and iron and chromium and zinc and nickel and cobalt and manganese. So if we get a precipitate after doing those two things, we now know that we have one of those group 3 metals. Now finally, at this point, only the group 1A and 2A ions are left. So, so the things that are insoluble in many, 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 or I should say, are soluble in many things. Group 2A are insoluble with phosphate, so adding something like ammonium uh, hydrogen phosphate causes the group 2A ions to precipitate. And then we know we have those. So at this point, we have group 4 or group 5 things potentially in solution. If we add something like ammonium hydrogen phosphate, and we get a precipitate, we know we had one or more things from group 4. The other things, all of our group 1 stuff plus potentially ammonium, they're still going to be dissolved because remember they're soluble in all of our situations. So anything that would be left at this point would have to be a group 5. So anything left has to be either an alkali metal or ammonium and you could use something like a frame, flame test to differentiate between those and the flame tests from different alkali metals are shown on page 278 so we can basically dip a wire loop into the solution pick up a little bit of the solution on the wire put it inside a flame and see what color it burns and we can use that to identify do we have sodium do we have potassium or do we potentially have ammonium so a flame test would tell us basically which group five we had and that ends our notes over chapter 17.